Hi. Hi, Laurie. Hi there. How you doing? Hi there. I'm fine. And you? Doing well. Doing well. Okay. Just excited to get a chance to do this uh, talk. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, well, we're happy, very happy that you're doing this. Oh, absolutely. Are, are there any questions right off the bat where you'd want me to start or does anyone have yeah, any well, questions? We have um, created one post before, and I think you responded in the post. Um, and uh, people asked some questions, so uh, we can uh, go through it through them later in the interview, okay. if you uh, if you like, yeah. and take uh, the best questions out. And uh, but before, um, I would ask you to uh, to maybe tell uh, what you uh, what you what you did in uh, in the UK when you were on the base. Okay, I, um, it was 1978 when I was stationed there. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah, okay. okay. in um, yeah, 19, May of 1978 is when I got to England and landed at Milden Hall, um, RAF Milden Hall, and then took a bus uh, to RAF Bentwaters in Woodbridge. And as soon as I got there, I got off the bus and I had this feeling like something was wrong, like, there was something about the place that I wanted to get. I wanted to go back on the bus and, and go back to the <laughs> RAF Milden Hall. I really did. I'm not kidding. It was like something was just off. Something was completely off. And and I was 18 at the time. So you got to understand, I'm, I'm, I'm the type of kid that wants to fit in and do a good job <laughs> and, and not pay attention to whatever this feeling that I was having uh, over me. And so I, I just kind of brushed it off. Um, but it was one of these things that would continue to build, build up. Um, because some, yeah. And it was funny because I had read the book Left at East Gate with um, uh, Larry Warren. And Larry said the same thing as soon as he got off the base. And it could be intuition, you know. Uh, and, you know, we both had that feeling like something's wrong, you know. And so, that, <laughs> so, so that that's probably one of the real reasons I think like Larry is the real deal because he he picked it up. And that's that's something that a lot of people um, don't even think about when they think about mm -hmm. Bentwaters yeah. and, and Woodbridge. And the so, base, uh, can you describe the base? Uh, because there were two uh, base, bases mm -hmm. and with, in between the Rendlesham Forest. Is that correct? Yes, yes. There was, yeah. um, there was RAF Bentwaters, and that was the mm -hmm. bigger base. That was, the, okay. uh, that was where every, pretty much we all lived. There were some folks that lived on the Woodbridge side, but it, that, mm -hmm. was, that was like a tiny little base. Um, we had the A-10s there at the time, but actually before the A-10s, we had the F-4 fighter planes there. And uh, it was, um, I felt like I went back in time. I mean, we were in the 19, <laughs> late 70s, and we had a lot of things that when we got there, there were Quonset huts with potbelly stoves in it. And I'm thinking, Okay. okay. <laughs> Not only do I have a bad vibe of this place, but now I'm, you know, it's like, it was just really, 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 really dreary. The, the, the plus side to it, though, was because I'm, I'm, I'm an eternal optimist, is that they had beautiful rose bushes all over the place. It's like, thank God. <laughs> they, had some, they, had, they had some beauty on, on the base. But yeah. Um, yeah, but I, uh, yeah, my, uh, uh, sponsor who picked me up. It was a husband and wife, uh, Jackie and John Frazier. And the first thing that uh, I think it was Jackie said to me, she kind of shouted to me, welcome to Cripple Creek. And I'm like, Cripple what? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> this is a Royal Air Force base. This this is a, got the word royal on it. That's going to mean something, you know? <laughs> and, yeah. and it was like, oh my God, I, I, I was it was just the beginning of just seeing just how, uh, you know, it was just, it, it was just a really depressing place. It, you know, it was, I really wanted to go back to RAF Milden Hall. And then none of this would have happened. I wouldn't have seen the UFO. I wouldn't have seen whatever, you know, it would have been like, uh, it was fun, but you know, they, at least <laughs> they had ice cream at that base. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and what what did a day at the base uh, what did it look like for you? I mean, what did you do? 
Well, during the day, I, well, I worked swings and mids when I got there. Now, but I, I do apologize. I got to backpedal a little bit. You mentioned about RAF Bentwaters and then there's RAF Woodbridge. And I didn't realize that we were part of a, like they call it a sister base. Uh, so working in law enforcement, I would work at both bases. So, uh, and, and it was, um, and, and RAF Woodbridge was pretty much the base. It was a crash base, apparently, during World War II. And there were a lot of haunted stories. You know, I was told that I was in the most haunted county in, in the world. And I thought, well, that's funny because I grew up in Suffolk County and Long Island, and this is Suffolk County, England. And I said, well, maybe they're trying to make me feel a little bit at home. But it was, um, but it, it, there was something about the place. It was very, very foreboding. And, um, but I'll get into that more in a little bit. So you were asking what I did during the day. For the most yes. part, working swings and mids, I was sleeping during the day. So I was, I felt like I was uh, turning into an owl. I was awake at night and then, you know, sleeping during my, my daytime. And then on my last day of my shift, uh, you get off work at eight o'clock in the morning and then they, they tell you, well, you're on break now. And I'm like, but I'm tired. I want to sleep. And they're like, no, no, you can't. You better stay up. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, there, there are times where I would, uh, because most of the guys in the squadron was majority of men and, and there was maybe about three or four women in the entire squadron. So, uh, so it was just kind of, uh, uh, I I lived in the dormitory on the opposite side of Bentwater, so I, I never really got to be a part of my my group, my flight. And uh, so when it came to breaks, I was uh, pretty much on my own. So sometimes I would jump on a train and go to London and see a play or do something like that because. Uh, it's the kind of thing we did in New York. If, we, if you have access to plays and whatnot, you, you go for the culture. So, uh, but you know, there was a lot of alone time at, you know, also. So, and that okay. was really, that was really a drag. Yeah. I can, can imagine. And, uh, you, you worked uh, at East gate. Is that correct? Yeah. The, um, the bases had several, they had the main gates, um, there were two main gates at Bentwaters, and then there was a back gate called Butley Gate, and it went it went through the town of Butley, and there was uh, from Butley would take you to East Gate, the, and that was like going on the back side of the base, and you would actually go through Rendlesham Forest, which I always thought was so beautiful. I, I thought I was in uh, some kind of Hansel and Gretel without the without the witch or whatever. You know, it was like, oh, here we are. Was, but um, Eastgate had the uh, Rendlesham Forest behind it, and, and and I was directly when when I was posted there, I could see the runway, and uh, and that was before they put up this. Uh, blast wall they put up a blast wall which really annoyed me because it it meant that i i had to stare at a wall instead of staring oh. out and at least seeing the the forest on the other side of the runway um but it was really during the swing shifts it was okay but it was during the midnight shift that it was it was scary as all anything anyone who worked out there would say the same thing and uh, I mean, we had people shooting their weapons off and doing crazy stuff just to get off there. I mean, it was, they were, you know, they either got possessed or who knows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, just if everyone had, but the base just gave off the, a negative vibe in a sense, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it kept getting worse. I mean, it, it was you know, it wasn't just the vibe of it. Now, now it started to press down on me. I was feeling like like I was carrying a, a lot of weight, like somebody put a bunch of sandbags on me and it, you know, it was holding me down and I was starting to lose my stamina. And that that in itself really, really scared me because I'm thinking, you know, I'm just a kid, you know, it's like I should be losing, you know, I should be able to go for a long time. But I mean, just it got to a point just when I was sitting in the gate shack and just standing up, it was just, uh, it, it took a lot and I'm thinking, you know, 
I have more stamina now than I did at that time, but whatever this energy was, it was really sucking the life out of me. It was, um, you know, and then I, I started getting really sensitive to light also. I, I kind of attributed to the fact that I was working swings and mids, but now it got to a point where I had, to, I was wearing, it was overcast and I was wearing sunglasses all the time because I, I, I just couldn't, you know, bear, bear the light. So, I mean, there were, there were, there were like things happening to, physically happening to my body at the time. And then I started putting on a lot of weight and it was just really, uh, it was like I was metamorphosing into something else. And it really, yeah. you know, it bothered me. Did you notice, uh, or did anyone else talk about having the same experiences uh, that you were like, just um, that on there, like everyone just did not feel okay at the base? Well, we didn't really talk about it because if you start complaining, then you're whining. And if you start, if you start whining, next thing you know, they're going, they're going to say, you know, Ray has got an attitude and, uh -huh. and, and, you know, there are all these things going on. So it's like you, 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 yep. know, you, you, you put up and shut up. Yeah. Um, that, that's very and, and, Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, yeah. And I do realize, yeah, suck it up. You know, it's, it's like, we don't care if you're afraid out there, you know, it's, it's, uh, in fact, if you're afraid, you're showing a sign of weakness. And if right. you're showing a sign of weakness, then, then they're going to really get on your case. I mean, this was a really hyper-masculine uh, career field. And, and all this time, I thought I was going to be helping little old ladies cross the street or, you know, <laughs> uh, or, you know, cop, you know, police are there to help, you know. I got that one wrong. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, and I, I just didn't like the. It was a lot of isolation. I mean, w once you were on post, you you would see the patrol guy uh, maybe once or twice during the evening time. Maybe they would give you uh, a break so you could go use the bathroom, or they'd give you a break so you could get something to eat. You know that kind of thing. But it, you know, so for the most part, I started feeling very, very isolated. I'd wake up. I'd have that little bit of time during guard mount to uh, talk to the guys. And then w once I was on post, that was it. And uh, so that was, you know, that was kind of a drag. I... That's pretty interesting. So you, <laughs> after all of this, you have the weight on your shoulders, you're gaining weight. It's a, this base, it's kind of a downer. And how long from when you got to the base to when you experienced the UFO, how long was, was that? What was that time? It was about, let me see, so yeah, it was about almost, uh, almost two years. Wow. Okay. Because, because I saw it in February 1980, and I was supposed to leave there in um, May of 80. But then I extended, and I stayed for another six months. And, uh, yeah, so anyway, it was... Um, yeah. And, and at that point, I, I was just, I had, by that that point, I felt like I'd been thrown under the bus a bunch of times. And I, I was just like, I was in a war zone. And I'd seen a lot of people act out, a lot of airmen act out, and they were being kicked out of the Air Force left and right. And I wasn't ready to leave. I kept it in my head like a mantra, the Air Force has got to be better than this. And... Uh, and they always said that the next base you're going to is the best base. And they said the worst, the worst base is the base that you're at. Uh, and then once you leave there, that becomes, oh, that, that was such a great base. And, and you got to understand, I've been in for now 27 years. And I still look back at that one. I'm like, what the hell happened? I mean, it was just, I didn't, I didn't get that same vibe that other people get, but Again, I respect other people that didn't go through what I went through, even though they were there. I, I just think it has something to do with uh, being um, empathetic or intuitive or being like this, uh, what do you call it, um, like an antenna for whatever this energy was. I, I, I just don't, you know, and, and, but I wasn't alone because there were several others that had gone through that. So, and that, yeah kind of made me feel a little bit better, but I didn't find out about like the RFI until uh, 1995, 96, when I saw the book by Larry Warren, uh, Left at Eastgate. And I was like, mm -hmm. Eastgate, who knows about Eastgate? Oh my God. I mean, you know, it was, I, I was just like, 
everything that I was holding in, because I didn't talk about it. I didn't talk about anything that happened at Bentwaters for many decades. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I really wanted to get some, uh, uh, I guess I wanted to talk to some of the guys that had experienced it and, and go through a kind of like get the feeling from them that they would say, you know, it's okay. You know, we've done, we've gone through this together, but instead, most, some of the guys that were there, you know, there, there was a real, excuse my language, but a real asshole mentality there among a, a lot of the, the, the cops. And it was still there. I mean, um, mm. John Burroughs kicked me off of his website, the Justice for the 81st Security Police Squad in 1980, because I wanted to talk about my UFO sighting that I really felt was just a piece of the puzzle. I, I never expected more or less, but if we put these pieces together, I think it will tell a completely different story and a story that needs to be heard. But yes. it just seems like everybody is just so focused on those three, four nights during, you know, when they were out in the woods. Um, and to me, um, that is an important piece. However, it's not the only piece. Well, where does where does your um, night line up with those three or four nights? Was was it one of those three or four nights, or? No, no, mine wasn't. That was in December, nineteen eighty. I had already left. I left uh, oh. December fifteenth. My sighting was about it was a precursor. It was about uh, eight months, uh, February, nineteen eighty. Uh, so, so when <laughs> so in Larry Warren's testimonial, he said that uh, in his debriefing when the the suit or whoever it was came in, maybe it was a guy in a military outfit as well. He said that, he said, we've been dealing with this for a lot longer you guys can possibly imagine. So mm -hmm. that obviously plays out. I thought that your sighting was, um, was within those three or four nights. So that's, that's really. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. And I think the reason they didn't have to debrief me is because I was already at that point, I was so marginalized that, mm -hmm. um, no one was really listening to me anyway. And I realized too at the time, because I had to report mine also. Mine was not, it didn't go like, oh, we saw it. Because uh, I wasn't by myself. There was another airman with me, uh, Keith Duffield. And so we both saw it together. And, and then I found out years later that, in fact, just recently that Doc Rhodes, uh, uh, another airman on my flight, he saw it from the main gate. And it was kind of neat because I thought, wow, now I know who was on the main gate at that time many, many years ago. But he saw it and he goes, well, he was like, that's really strange, you know. And we saw it, but it was very, very close to us. And we were just uh, very, very quiet, just kind of staring at it, trying to figure it out. And uh, uh, while but, I was going to say, while you're, why don't you just start from uh, that evening? Let's just, just get into your actual sighting. So let's just uh, start with okay. that. Okay, sure. Well, it was a midnight shift. Now, over in England, you, you have to understand that February is it's mostly dark. It's like it's like the longest they have the longest nights there. And um, so anyway, I um, it was about three o'clock in the morning, and we had to go down to the East Gate. And at the time, East Gate was locked, so we had to go and check the fence and check the the lock the padlock on it and I had to get out because sometimes the supervisor would put a card or something behind it and you know so anyway I was just doing my job and I got back in the car and then I backed up the truck excuse me I, I, we were in a pickup truck and I backed up the pickup truck and headed back over to East Gate and and parked on this uh it's like a parking like a pad and but I was still facing off base uh, I was facing in the direction of the North Sea and I was starting to fill out my, you know, my check sheet. I mean, it was just really mundane stuff, but I'm doing my job and I'm talking to Keith saying, so where do you want to be in 20 years? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> you know? I mean, we were just killing time. I guess that's where I learned to, uh, to chit chat, as my daughter would say. Um, so, and then we looked up and we saw uh, this light coming in and it was coming in as an approach, like uh, it, it was, it looked like it was, it was big. It was about the size of a cargo plane uh, based on the lights the way it was, it was, uh, it was almost like this uh, 
oval where it was, you know, like that, like a football resting on the side. And uh, so we were just staring at it. And then I was thinking, oh, the runway lights are going to go on soon because the runway was to my left. So I'm, I'm staring at it and we're watching it. And it's coming in like a regular approach. It, you know, I mean, it, it had everything that made it look like an aircraft was about ready to land. So in my mind, I'm thinking about, do I have the check sheets to do um, customs work? Because it's coming in from another, it's coming in from North Sea <laughs> area. So I'm going to have to check it for, you know, make sure they didn't bring any contraband into the country. And so I'm thinking, well, you know, just real, you know, uh, doing my job, you know, just doing my and then it was about maybe, oh gosh, um, 50 yards. It wasn't very far from us, but, and it was about maybe 20, 30 feet up in the air. So it was very low and it um, stopped in, in midair. And now, now this is where it completely changes because the lights never go, went on. I kept looking over. Why aren't the blue lights going on? What's going on here? You know, so it's, there were a few things that weren't making any sense. And then it started making these geometric movements. It started going like up, down, left, right. And then it, then it kind of like, it, it didn't burst fast, but it was almost like a, like, it, like it kind of burst and into these three pieces. And then it flew, it kind of did an arc. It, it kind of flew lower to the ground. So it was actually um, even that much lower, maybe about 10 feet or something like that off the ground. And then it, the three pieces flew up into the night sky. And, you know, we had a few, we didn't know what to, you know, we were just, what would he say? You know, I mean, what was that? You know, part of me was thinking, I kept looking at the window. Do you think it'll come back? Because we, we really need to, to, to digest this. And, um, and this happened probably within probably 10, 20 minutes, um, this, this whole watching it approach and doing its thing. Um, so it wasn't fast, but it wasn't like, you know, uh, you know, it took an hour or whatever to do what it did. And then, so anyway, we knew we had to report it because it flew over the base. It breached military airspace. And so I hand my radio, a handheld radio, because because the desk sergeant hates Lori. And I'm like, here, Keith, you gotta you gotta report it, man. <laughs> and and Keith is like, no, 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 you're the lead patrol, you gotta report it. So we're handing the radio back and forth. And I'm like, damn, Ugh. I was not happy. I was not happy at all. So yeah, I get on the radio and I'm like, Police control, uh, this is police for uh, be advised that, you know, it was an aircraft that flew over the base. And they were, at one point, um, I didn't get too much into the description when uh, Alan Cohen, the desk sergeant at the time, said, get on the landline. So I went, got out of my truck and went into East Gate and went to the landline and, and explained what happened. And he was kind of like, oh, <laughs> like, okay. Like Ray felt seeing UFOs is what he's doing. And I was like really annoyed, but he did give me some good advice. He said, go to the air tower and check to see what they found on the radar. So that's what I did. So we went there and we knocked on the door. It was a, the, the air tower, the way it was designed, uh, we, we parked in front of it. And then there were these metal steps on the outside. So you had to walk up these outside metal steps and then you were on a platform and at the platform was the door on the side that you would go and knock on the door. So we knocked on the door and we knocked and knocked and no one answered. And then finally this guy answered and he had we woke him up. It, obviously we woke him up. It was like, oh, oh, oh. I'm like, great. And we asked him though, figuring, well, maybe they had something that they could tell what was going on with the, um, the, uh, air, you know, uh, on radar, maybe they were able to record it or something. So, so I was like, well, did you see anything on the radar? And he said, oh, no, no, nothing on the radar. And, and, he, and then he said, it, it, you know, what you might have seen was afterburners from a, a, from a British base nearby. And I'm thinking 
afterburn. I didn't even deal with him. I was like, afterburn is this is all going through my mind. I'm like, sonic boom. This thing didn't make any noise. This thing was like no no mechanical, no propulsion kind of no, noise, nothing. And but I, you know, I I've been there for at least two years, and duh, I know what sonic, you know, what happens with uh, yeah, when it, yeah, that whole thing. So. So I'm standing there still on this, and he went back into his little, I guess he went back to sleep. And I'm standing out there and I'm just thinking about this whole thing, the processing, the, this whole, you know, uh, afterburner. And I'm looking out toward the North Sea. And one thing I didn't, didn't pay attention for, again, for many years, because I remember this, it was already becoming daybreak. And usually in in England in February, daybreak doesn't happen till about like six o'clock in the morning or something like that. And but it was so seamless from what we were going through. We, it it was we didn't notice that you know it was already daybreak. You know, it could have been we thought time flies. You know, I mean we're you know, but we lost we lost about two hours of time because to go from three o'clock in the morning to looking out and seeing the sky starting to clear up. Um, yeah, that, that so you, said a lot to me. Uh, you lost time. So, so yes, you, you definitely lost time. Yes. We that's, lost two hours. That's yeah. so, so, oh, I, wow. <laughs> so yeah, well, fascinating. So um, I don't know if we want to keep going on with, with what, uh, transpired after that with with your um with your uh, other other people that you were working with and having to record it or go on to have you done any regression to see what happened with those two hours or i was just talking recently to this guy named ian uh Holling, and he had asked me the same thing and i told him i would love to i mean i've been wanting to but you know i i you know never had the opportunity yet and and he's oh well i know so and so and so and so i mean all these people are coming out with resources that i was like whoa this is great i mean yes i i definitely want to know because there is more you know to really what happened and uh and there were other you know there were other events there while i was there we had a uh there were several paranormal kind of events that happened to me when i was there uh do you want me to talk about that or you yeah of course yeah okay 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 about, um just to say i actually had a question about the sighting like the specific okay. like the cross did you do it like several times or just one time um and you kind of mentioned it was primarily just like a white like a white um football like, yeah yeah so when it divided was it almost as if like the light divided within itself and it was three you could see the mm -hmm. three Lights yes. Yeah. 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 It. It. A, yeah. It changed. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It changed its shape. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that, that. That was. That was really telling when it did the when yeah. it when it hovered and not making any sounds and it was there for about a minute and then uh, then when it did the geometric movement it was you know I was wondering if it was thinking oh man we're not supposed to be seen darn I don't know you know yeah. if, if that was what was going on. Or, you know, because something changed it, you know, the fact that it stopped where it did uh, before it flew over the runway was, you know, I, I just, yeah. that's what I think, you know, I, I don't. <laughs> Nuclear co connection. Yeah, I'm just thinking that maybe it thought I was asleep like the, the guy in the air tower, you know, you don't, you know, you don't know. Well, so when it broke those pieces did you know to, did, were you able to make out the shapes of each of the three piece pieces that broke broke into no the, this, this light was so bright that i i couldn't see anything i mean yeah we we just couldn't see anything and uh and, and so for you your stream of consciousness there you saw this and it, it was all just smooth for you but mm -hmm. then but then at the end of the night or at the end of the event you're thinking wait a minute it's morning <laughs> yeah 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 and even then even then i i mean i i really didn't take it take it in as to say why is it why is it daybreak now you know it just seemed like 
but maybe we've been, like I said, busy or something like that. But there's no way to go from three o'clock in the morning. And the reason I know it was three o'clock is because that was the time I was supposed to be at Eastgate to check the locks and, you know, writing it down. So, uh, so, so we would have, you know, so th that was obvious. But what we did between the time of checking it and going to the air tower, just, uh, yeah, that was just too much time to go by. And, and Keith, uh, uh, Keith had the same experience with uh, regarding time. Using you know, time. I don't, I, I don't know. I, I mean, he should have. I could say, but I, I haven't really talked to him. The, the last time I talked to him was maybe about, I don't know, ten, fifteen years ago. He's in Oklahoma, and and all he said was, mm -hmm. "Wow, that was really strange. All those lights. <laughs> you remember that?" <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like. I'm like, yeah, okay. yeah, I sure do. <laughs> but he's a good guy. He's a good guy. So, you know, I mean, he, I guess he hasn't really shown any interest in, you know, talking about it. Where with me, it, it really, uh, the place really affected me. And it really got into my, almost got into like my DNA. And, and I just, uh, you know, just want, I, I feel like I have questions and I want answers. And, oh. you know, and that's hard. So then what are the answers from the regression if you did the regression what happened there i don't know i mean oh. if, I, I i mean i haven't had a regression yet but oh well, uh, I'm sorry that you did i'm sorry oh no 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 but i could speculate what would happen and i'd be like yeah i figured it. i was on that aircraft pandora's <laughs> and, box <laughs> yeah, yeah you know you know and, and the funny thing is, recently I was I, I did I was on a, a contact in the desert with uh, the the uh, cosmic cafe, and because I'm still trying to, I I have a need to to get the word out because I have a need to also learn as much as I can from from others, so I <laughs> I was there and. All the people, there were several, there were not many, there were maybe four or five people, and all of them had um, benevolent experiences. Oh, it was wonderful. It was, it was, it was the best thing that happened. And all I could think about was Saturday Night Live with Kate McKinnon say, oh, well, I wish I was there drinking hot chocolate and with cinnamon in it. I, I mean, <laughs> mine was hell. They, they stuck me in the corner and gave me a bowl of water, you know, so it's like, you know, so, so, I mean, that was just something that caught me off guard that how come I didn't have a benevolent experience there? <laughs> I, I had... Just to let you know, I have to drop off. So it was a great talk. Okay. okay. Hear the Very rest. nice. All right. Okay. You take care. <laughs> Bye. Um, yeah. Was, was there any like um, specific feeling when you saw the craft or at any point when you're seeing the craft? Um, just based on like you mentioned how after it split, it was very bright. And I was kind of just maybe seeing some similarities how over time, like in that environment, you're getting more and more like fatigued just more sensitive to light and things like that. So is there any type of um, feeling that you felt was kind of like odd at any point in time during uh, when you're witnessing the craft? No, actually <laughs> not. It, it pretty much started coming out throughout the years when I, after I left uh -huh. there and I started to come out with these, uh, I keep having recurring dreams. Okay. And um, it's real. The one thing that's nice about recurring dreams is that it'll take you to the same place and you start to know the place even that much more. And, you know, and w one place it takes me to is back to England, where I spend most of my time in my dream telling people I don't belong here. I'm just, in fact, I'm a, I'm a major. You don't put a major on the gate. <laughs> and uh, uh, and then I'm in the desert and I'm heading to place um, that turned out it's called the zone of silence in Mexico and the way I found out about that is I happened to get a free complimentary magazine of uh, from National Geographic and there was the pond in there and I'm like oh my god you know it's like that's that's the one that's in my dream and uh, it's like aqua color water that's butted up near these brown mountains and you know and it's just very very real so i do think that whatever i had seen or what i experienced over there they they definitely um 
put something in my mind. And I yeah. talked to several other witnesses and they, they said the same thing. And I mean, like, so like with the binary um, information that, that Jim Pemison went there, I believe it. I believe it. Uh, I believe that, you know, uh, you know, John Burroughs had his experiences. Larry had his experiences. There were several others. Steve LaPlume, he had a separate incident that occurred that, um, yeah, and it, it did the same thing with him. It's something that um, he he just recently wrote a book called From Rendlesham to Redemption. Um, so, you know, it, it, it affected, there are some airmen that it really affected and, and in some cases not really in a positive way. Yeah. And um, yeah. How so did it, how did this affect you? Um. Good question. Well, I I'm just trying to connect the pieces together. The biggest commonality with uh, what happened over in England. Uh, one thing is that it's not far from this place called Sutton Who, S U T T O N, and uh, I think it's H O O, and they have. Um, they have these mounds there that's in the shape of, and I'm probably going to pronounce it incorrectly. I do apologize. Pallades. Um, it's a star cluster in the sky. And in my dream, um, being near that zone of silence, you know, I, 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 I learned that they have a lot of, um, they, they got a lot of activity with these uh, really, really tall, uh, people that have blonde hair and whatnot and you get stuck in the desert and the next thing you know they are there to help you get unstuck in the in the, in the desert kind of like triple a i guess yeah there are three of them too so i guess it would be triple a uh, but you know and then they disappear apparently they're like oh thank you thank you you know and 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 then they're gone and so i think pallades has a big piece of it um and, you know, so, yeah. And then I think about, when I think about Pallades, I think about, sometimes I think that maybe that could be where this place that we call heaven is located. And, uh, um, but right now the only way you can get there is if you die. And soon we're gonna be learning more about going through portals to get there if we don't have to die. So, so, uh, so I answered all the questions about Christianity now. <laughs> Can, yeah, yeah. Well, but well, uh, I, I I heard about people saying, okay, this truth if it comes out, it makes everybody go to church, <laughs> and I was like, okay, why? <laughs> yeah, no, but, I, I yeah, I, I mean, I I don't, I I think that there's there are things in the Bible that really kind of you know people, you know, people want to interpret what they want to, but when it comes right down to it, there are very explicit parts that talk about some of the events that we that were that we've experienced with other beings and and whatnot and i i do believe that um i mentioned earlier that the other events i had were uh one of them was that uh i was at raf woodbridge it was a midnight shift again it was dark cold rainy um and I was in what they call the non-nuclear uh, weapon storage area. And what's interesting about this area was that they had recently spent tens of thousands of dollars renovating this particular area. And, and, and because at the time that's where they, they kept nuclear bombs there. And then they had, a, they had nuclear bombs over on, on uh, uh, Woodbridge, I mean, Bentwaters. And when I first got there, they actually moved the weapons from Woodbridge over to Bentwater's side. And so it was, people were like, yeah, it was really strange that we were there and they were doing all this building and then they kind of turned it into a non-nuclear uh, storage area. So I was in there and uh, I was getting ready to get my building check sheet out and I'm heading, walking over to the, uh, to the bomb, um, it's like these grassy, they look kind of like Quonset huts covered in grass where they kept them. And so I was getting ready to do my thing and all of a sudden I had a flash in my head 
and it was this eight eight foot nine foot um giant muscular praying mantis and and it said don't go it, this was all in my head it said don't go and i thought to myself okay i'm not going I'm, i'll go back to my gate check and i'll check my buildings when it's daybreak um and that was another thing i would never share with anybody it took me many many years and then when i did people are telling me that they've had experiences with uh these giant i guess mantids or something like that and they're uh you know, um, and one of them happened to be at another military Air Force base in uh, California in at Edwards Air Force Base. And it just really blew my mind because, you know, in my head, you know, so now it's kind of like, and this happened before the uh, UFO sighting. So I, I kind of think that um, I, and I've had this for a long time when I, since I was a kid that I, I, I do feel like I do have some gifts, you know, something that's, I can't quite explain. I'm not saying I'm really good at it and I'm not going to say I'm going to be psychic to the point where I'm able to go on those cr crime shows and solve things. But, uh, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, when I get those flashes, it's like really, you know, it, it turns out to be true. Uh, I, I had it you're, once. Yeah. You're, um, like, are there specific, um, I understand it's more kind of like, um, like a mind's eye type of flash. Are there yes. any colors or the different every time, any geometry at all? Just. Yeah. Well, well, I have, I've had it some. Mantid experience maybe. Um, are you saying have I had it before, after? Yeah, or? Like, um, like that experience you described with the um, mantid shortly mm -hmm. before the UFO encounter. Was there like any specific color, or was just kind of was that like the first time something like that happened to you? Um, um, I, in that particular case, getting that flash in my mind, and then the don't go thing. Um, and, you know, I got the feel, feeling like he was pacing back and forth. Mm -hmm. He was at the far end closest to uh, Rendlesham Forest. And, he, you know, so I figured he was really, really busy. And, yeah, I didn't want to disturb him, I guess. <laughs> you know, which is, you know, uh, it really says that I was scared enough to say that I didn't want to go there because I really didn't want to approach uh, a giant praying mantis. <laughs> On the other hand, um, I guess I wasn't that scared that I needed to run out of the place. And, you know, I just went back to my, to my little geek shack and listened to my, uh, I had some music and I was listening to the sun will come up tomorrow. That's it on dollar. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, like I said, I was, I was definitely in the survival mode there, but you know, as, as years have gone on, though, it, it, this whole thing is always, pre it's presented itself, uh, especially if something's happening with someone. Like, for instance, uh, I, I, was at, I was at a picnic and this woman was sitting next to me and I felt this vibration of this person I couldn't see, but it was a flash in my head again. And this woman had like a short cage haircut and uh you know kind of heavy set and she she told me to tell her her sister uh tell her that she's okay and and i was like okay so i said to the woman next to me and this is uh gosh maybe about 10 years ago and i said to her i said you're not going to believe me and and i do apologize and and i don't understand it but um do you have someone close to you? Like your, your sister, did she pass away? And she looked at me and she's, oh my God, like, you know, and, and she goes, yeah, it was about a few weeks ago. I said, well, she's here right now and she's hugging you and she just wants you to know that she's okay. Uh, she burst out crying. Talk about ruining the picnic for her or ruining <laughs> <laughs> And I just felt, I just felt like, so, you know, I don't feel, there's no comfort, I don't feel, I don't feel comfortable about it, but uh, I roll with it because I feel like, 
there's got to be some truth to it. And uh, there, there was this other place over in over on Bentwater side at the Ivy Lodge gate, where the we had I had to go up to the uh, lock site that's liquid oxygen site and they had um, uh, it was right up against the outside gate of Ivy Lodge, which would get, get, get you off base. But this one fence line that I had to drive over, I ended up um, getting this again, a flash. It was like this crazed man and uh, call him swamp man. And I knew I couldn't see it. I couldn't see for the life of me, but I knew that on the other side of this fence line was like a pond of water. There was water there and I knew something bad happened there. And, and whatever it was that was on the other side of the fence was kind of just trying to scare me and did a good job because I had really, really uh, didn't like going there. And, and I, I had to get out, touch the lock, jump into my car, car, and I would put it in reverse and put the gas on, I pull it back just to get out of there, <laughs> because it, you know, because you don't want to see this deathly looking face with dark hair, looking all muddy and crazy, you know. Uh, so it turns out that not far from Ivy Lodge Gate, there was this uh, place called Rendlesham Hall. And Red Rendlesham Hall, Hall was actually in the 1920s was used for people for the uh, inebriates and people that have drug and alcohol problems. Mm -hmm. And they were living there. Um, and it was like an asylum place. And, you know, and that kind of made sense to me for that one. So anyway, I, I had several things like that happen and I just, you know, you know just kind of keep it to, so when I saw the UFO, that was like, okay, here we go. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it just, you know, it adds to it, but, um, yeah, so there was a lot of paranormal stuff going on over there too. And interestingly, my mom came to visit while I was there and she, uh, didn't say a word. I'm, I'm trying to show off this place that I can't stand being at. But, you know, I wanted her to feel proud of, oh, I'm in the Air Force. Look what I'm doing. And we stopped at the gates and we were talking to the to the law enforcement guy so my mom could see some of the things that I do. And, and we're, we're driving across the runway and we had to stop, not the runway, the, uh, the taxiway. We had to stop and let the A-10 pilot go by. And I thought that was cool. It's like being at a three, like four-way stop. And, oh, well, yeah, you, it's your turn to go. And and my mom didn't say a word. I, I started thinking, what's, you know, what's going on? And, and immediately she said, Lori, I'm getting you out of here. Mom, what do you mean? I am getting you out of here. There's something wrong with this place. I got to get you out of here. Whatever it is, is bad. And I was like freaking out mm. because I was like, oh my God, my mom feels it, you know? And I'm thinking, you know, I, if she'd been on the base, she'd been in the area for maybe, maybe what, 10 minutes. And all of a sudden she's telling me she's got to get me out of here. And I told her, I said, mom, it's not like I joined a record club or a, you know, <laughs> one of those things where you buy 12 records and then you got to buy one every month and you, bail me out of it. I, I said, no, I, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to finish my time. And, um, yeah, but she then said that she felt like it followed me to, um, Wickham market where I was living at that point, I was living off base. And, and, and for me, that was a reprieve just living and working on base, which is like, it was just, it was just too much. I, my, my body, the, uh, it was just sucking the life out of me literally yeah 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 and what did you with um because um your experience was a precursor to what was going to happen um later there mm -hmm. were about four days i uh, you told me um mm -hmm. where other uh, events happened yeah um did you hear about them uh, during your time at the base nope 
No, because no. when I left there, no, when I left there in 19, I left there in December of 1980. And we didn't have any, like any communication or access to be able to talk to anybody. And there wasn't really anybody there that I wanted to write to. Um, I, I just wanted to get as far away from that place as possible. And yeah, I kind of wanted just to move forward forget it, you know, whatever happened is crazy. But w w what I learned over time is that it's something that y you can only bury it so far. And then, you know, um, you know, it's got to come out. And I, I think that, you know, what I felt all in all, when I look back out at it is that there was a war going on, an invisible war that was going on. And I, I think a lot of it had to do with uh, us having nuclear bombs there. I think that was a big piece of it. And I think that that there are other beings that aren't even, you know, not like us and that are just really worried about us, worried about humanity. Uh, you know, I think they're worried about what we're doing to our planet now. Um, and, uh, so I, I just think in the way we treat other beings and the way we treat animals and that kind of thing, I, I just, you know, that's just what I think. Yeah. And, and what, what surprises me is that uh, exactly one year after your experience, I believe it was also February, uh, sorry, uh, uh, one year before your experience, um, a UFO flew over a Dutch base called uh, Soesterberg. And mm. it also allegedly stored nukes they built a special bunker it was a dutch american base they built oh. a special uh, bunker there to store weapons well we know mm -hmm. of course why it was built and it was the only bunker guarded by american soldiers wow so what happened uh, is uh something came fl uh, flew in the same as you uh, told uh, mm -hmm. they saw a light but it was like, okay, uh, it's not coming. It's, it's still there. You know, it took too mm -hmm. long for an airplane flies much faster. And then suddenly they noticed that the, the, there were two lights, but they were so far apart. This was an enormous craft. Mm -hmm. And it was also, it had a structure behind it. It was geometrical, probably a triangle. They saw also a mm -hmm. rectangle behind it. And it had one red beam uh, pointing down and three wow. white lights 12 soldiers saw it i believe that one even stood inside the red beam um it didn't separate in sep uh, but they did see it uh, make a turn and suddenly shut off mm -hmm. and it's a massive event but mm -hmm. you know you have to connect the dots like okay it happened mm -hmm. uh, 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 at Rendlesham forest etc at the base there also in the Netherlands. And what is the connection? Well, the nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And it also uh, followed the track of the runway. So it's mm -hmm. almost exactly the same as your experience, wow. except for the fact that it didn't break apart. It didn't split. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well, the other thing too is like over where we were located, they were also doing a lot of um, yeah, like projects working with uh, uh, frequencies, you know, because this is all during the Cold War and everybody's afraid of the Russians. And what we don't realize is that their equipment is rusting away. And, you know, <laughs> we had nothing to worry yeah. about, really. No. But, um, yeah, but I mean, but the hype was is that, yeah, the Russians are going to come over and, you know, so they wanted to make our aircraft invisible uh, by doing radar jamming, is what they call it. And um, they had one at, they had one project over near uh, where we were called uh, Cobra Mist, and there were several others uh, other things out there. But I, what I really think happened is that this experiment went awry. I don't know if it was specifically that one or uh, others, but because they've been, it's almost like somebody said, "We're going to give you billions of dollars, and you're going to figure out uh, how to." do time travel or something like that, or do, you know, uh, uh, make things disappear or do something with physics. And what they did is this equipment made a high pitched sound. And what I truly believe is that it ripped a hole in our, 
uh, like our dimension. And it's like, it's like a vacuum. It's like all this air, uh, except the reverse. It's like all this negative energy was coming out of this rip. This, when we got there, it was like, it was just pouring into, onto the bases. And, um, but I, I, you know, I, I don't doubt that. I just don't doubt. I mean, you've got that, you've got like the Manhattan project. I mean, there's so many different things going on and, you know, they don't, make it seem like it's you know you've got corporations like at the time rc rc rca was one of the one of the companies working on cobra mist and i'm thinking you mean that little cute little dog that's on the phonograph on the records you know i mean you know that makes all this nice music is cobra mist you know (laughs) so you know there's a there's a real dark side of of what, yeah, what humanity is doing, uh, and, Absolutely. and yeah, and and we can only guess. I, I think um, with the new the news about the disclosure of UFOs coming out, I, I think it, it 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 happened probably the way I thought it would. Like, really, not too much stuff. You know, it's like okay, yeah, tic tac, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know. It, it it wasn't like okay we're going to tell you the truth we've got these underground facilities where we've got we're working with these uh, interstellar uh, beings who are helping us create you know uh, to get to the next step in whatever technology that we're trying to do and you know I mean that's what we want to hear that's what we want to hear like who's exactly. behind all this we don't want to hear. Well, yeah, we saw that. See that? I know you can't really see it well. Watch it disappear. <laughs> okay. It's like, that's not it. So no. what What I hope if anyone takes from this conversation is that we, we need to look at, at the residual effects of what people experience when they see a UFO. It doesn't yeah. matter if, if you... When you've seen a UFO, all of them together, because everybody is given you're down. Something's being downloaded into you, and it it's going to come out, and you're not going to know. You may not. You, this one guy, uh, Stacy Smith, he saw a UFO, and he was over in England too, same place, and he's got these calculations that he doesn't about propulsions and different things like that. And this this guy, he didn't go to college he he handed it off to somebody who was like an engineer to say what is this what what is this that's in my head that i'm bringing out mm-hmm. so that's why i i truly believe like the binary code uh, this place like how i know about see they were practicing frequencies over in england yet in my dream i go to the zone of silence which is a place where no frequencies are picked up in that area i mean to me that's really really kind of creepy <laughs> you know it's like yeah you know it's it's, it's yeah and and do you think they know more do you think they know more um i just i just think that i think i don't know Uh, i do think they know more but i don't know like why we're given this information we're we're given like such small baby pieces you know maybe maybe it's because we can't really comprehend if anything that could be you know the comp- our comprehension um but i i uh, I, I do think that that would be a a, pro- um, a productive step if we paid attention to not the physical location of where people are seeing these lo- these objects but to really understand that they're downloading stuff into us to help us understand war and until we're like going through an awakening to to realize that yeah this is some crazy shit you know <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah well we assume that reality is the way it is but we can be completely wrong it's all yeah. based on what we see what we perceive but there is so much more we do not perceive and mm-hmm. you know science is not uh, 
the current level of with the current level of science you cannot explain everything yeah it's and that a lot, simple. i think i think a lot has to do with our consciousness too because we don't understand what that is either i mean Correct. you know i mean we, we uh like you, some um leaf when he mentioned about have i gone through regression i'm i i'm i'm all for it because i mm -hmm. you know if, if i can get more answers out of you know my experience that would be great and do you know leslie king leslie king yeah uh king? is she the woman that writes those books yeah yeah she's, very, she's a pro journalist yeah. yeah and she uh also made a series on netflix surviving death so um i think um and she's she also in, into ufos and she wa was the woman who um initiated in, in fact the new york times article Oh, about yes, UFOs. Yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I haven't met her or really talked to her. I, I actually tried to reach out to her one time, but didn't didn't get any. Yeah, anywhere. I think it would be nice if you if you two meet yeah. because, um, well, she knows a lot, and uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, every account. Have you, is... have you met her? No, 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 oh, no. Okay. But I do follow her. And I know that mm -hmm. she's also into the consciousness part of the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And um, she made a beautiful, really a beautiful uh, documentary that was uh, on Netflix, streamed on Netflix, Surviving Death. And wow. um, so, you know, what you're telling is true. Uh, as a whole, we have to go to a higher level. And for, for a lot of people, it sounds like crazy. Some people even get angry. Like, why? Why do I have to step out of my comfort zone? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because th that's it. People go to work, uh, yeah. they sleep, they eat, they go on holidays. Yeah. And that's it. And for a lot of people, that's enough. They don't want yeah. to accept that there is more. They don't want to step out of that comfort zone to see that there is more, to develop their themselves um yeah i think i think it's 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 a tough cookie <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah. I, and i think i think with me personally i i've been on that i've been on this journey since i was a little kid you know the the whole concept of the meaning of yeah. life a asking my mom to I, I saw the film in 69 or something when i was about 10 years old like chariot of the gods you know and where it points out all these things it's like yeah why is that there yeah why is that there? yes and I mean, and the irony of, I think, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind came out like either a year after or a year before uh, my UFO sighting. So it was just, you know, and there were so many elements of it that I just found to be interesting. And that film was the, uh, you know, why do I know what I know when I shouldn't know what I know? You know, so, you yes. know what I mean? <laughs> yes, and exactly. Through, uh, they communicate with frequency to the uh with the ufo they use the like the frequency on the keyboard that's kind of interesting. yeah 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 sometimes i i i hum that little melody and <laughs> trying to hope maybe i can get somebody to come down here because i'm still waiting for more uh <laughs> more information but um but yeah and and i think you know you can also get a lot out of what you mentioned about leslie king's uh um uh, surviving death is, is, is was that the name of it correct yeah. um the uh the people that have those near-death experiences i think are really mm -hmm. um it's telling i mean and i do believe that uh it's it's helped me i i gotta say with the the passing of my brother to to know the different realms he he had to go through to get where mm -hmm. he is now and mm -hmm. uh, um he passed recently yeah, yeah yeah he did yeah so um so yeah, yeah so i think and i think that's part of it i mean that's a whole you mm -hmm. know talk about moving mm -hmm. through dimensions i mean we're already doing it but unfortunately the way we're doing it is we can't go back you know? exactly <laughs> yeah we can only I mean, pass <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i'm still waiting for houdini to come back and tell oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. but then exactly. again then again, time may not exist there. So maybe they think they're there for a second and they've actually, you know, been there. Exactly, exactly. And, it's for, for, and for us, it's agonizing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a great big paradox for sure. 
well this this whole subject this subject involves so much and there are people mm -hmm. you know who cling on to the nuts and bolts aspect mm -hmm. of the phenomenon yeah other people love the the aliens uh others say no it's artificial intelligence and you have so ma man many people thinking different things but it's also a good thing because you know we are all uh, exploring all aspects mm -hmm. of the phenomenon. And I yeah. think the, the consciousness aspect is very important. And the, maybe the paranormal has also some uh, yeah, uh, oh, yeah. things to do with it. Yeah, yeah some of absolutely. Related. I think, um, I think it's uh, Ray Hernandez who is kind of does work um, to carry on for Edgar Mitchell's foundation. He kind of... Hmm some research and kind of came to the conclusion that there are um, correlations to people who have like experiences like paranormal experiences from you know UFOs uh -huh. all the way uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. big term, but, um, and a lot of their attitudes and behavior and just how they um i guess you could say some uh, toward, just really attitudes and perception uh -huh. and really when you think about consciousness it's very interesting to me just to think about how maybe some of these sightings are specific for specifically for people or it's designed for people who have um more capability for perception so that was yeah, something yeah. You know, on your experiences where it seems like you're definitely more um tuned to other things that some people like just you know it doesn't even phase them mm -hmm. at all so mm -hmm. maybe yes these sightings you know it's almost deliberately for that person because you know the other individual can't really process that information that they may no. uh, send out in whatever way or yeah. you, know, you could go on forever but um i've definitely noticed like with some of my experiences and then just other people's experiences there does seem to be um a greater sense of something that experiencers are like drawn to this or you know even maybe even vice versa so. mm -hmm. yes yeah i i i yeah you're you're singing my song yeah that, that's that's for sure um yeah and I, I think sometimes it's you know it's you know i i don't like the idea of being afraid i mean when i was a little kid you know we we, we had some uh i i did have some experiences back then uh one was i had a mother mary the mother of jesus sighting when i was hmm. in third grade and I thought it was a statue, but then it, it, it disappeared. All the statues statues in this in the school were beige, except for this one. The statue I saw, it was gorgeous. It had flower, red roses. It was all vibrant and everything. And, and then when I passed the second set of double doors, it was gone. I'm like, where'd they put that statue? How'd they move it? You know, it was just <laughs> uh, uh, so I went home and I was still trying to figure that one out. But I mean, so I, I've had these types of things throughout my life and i i think that also people that are uh, i was t i was talking with this guy ian hauling the other day and he had asked me are you are you a vegetarian or vegan and i said yeah i said yeah i've been now for about 20 years and he said he said it, it, you know you compassionate towards animals and you know whatnot and i said absolutely i'm a i'm all for animal rights and that kind of thing and you know it's just kind of just to treat every living being with you know with with respect. respect and with the love you know a lot of what we're talking about has to do with our ability to really you know love one another uh, without saying come on people now smile for each other without going through a song, um, it's like, if lo love is like a sword, it's like if, if, if we're going through this war that we're going through in this world that we can't see, our, our, our tools, our weapons of choice should be kindness and love. Exactly. And, and yeah. I just think, I mean, I, I truly, truly believe that. And um, until we stop, yeah, doing all this self, this destruction and, and whatnot. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's painful where our world is. And uh, because I do believe that what we see in nature is truly a form or an idea of paradise. Um, 
but this other realm that people talk about going to heaven, um, I think it's the same. It's got the same characteristics without without the hatred and the uh, evil, greed, the whole thing, the whole thing. So, uh, and yes, when I was in the military, they asked me many times, what are you doing in the military? Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking this. Yeah. I was just and, thinking this. And, and I, would tell, <laughs> I would tell them, I would tell them, you need me. You need me. So, yes. yeah. you know. And, <laughs> Yeah. And that's why I became that's why I became an officer, you know. I was like, they really need me, you know. We we need to uh reform treat each other, <laughs> treat yeah. each other with dignity and respect and you know, yeah. yeah. And um uh, about Colonel Charles Hall, did you talk to him at one time or I actually talked to him in 95, 90, 96 when I when I first found out about the uh the, you know that the ufo came back mm -hmm. um and uh we talked a little bit i i called him up and then i said to him isn't it weird that you live in woodbridge virginia <laughs> and everything happened at raf woodbridge you know it's, oh yeah 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 near, the connections <laughs> yeah yeah he he didn't even notice it and, uh, <laughs> but uh yeah he uh He's he's the he's the face of credibility. That that's the main thing. Um, Lori had no credibility back then. I was just an airman. I was just a, a kid. I was a woman. Been told too many times to be barefoot and pregnant. And I said I don't want to be barefoot or pregnant. You know, I like wearing <laughs> shoes, and I don't want to have babies yet. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so it's it's uh, so I had I I was way below the uh, credibility factor. So I think that, like I said, I was marginalized. That's why it was re really easy for them to uh, shut me up because I saw the writing on the wall and I said, fine, fine, I'm going to just shut up. But um, except when the thing flew over the base, I can't shut up on that one. You know, it was just, a, no. you know, um, and, but then it really... Tragically, I realized that, you know, Jesus Christ could have come up to me and given, told me the meaning of life, and I would have had to send him over to the public affairs office. You know, I was like, <laughs> don't tell me. <laughs> no, I can't. I love you. However. <laughs> yeah. But there's so many people, uh, so many people at, people at the base saw these things, like, like Larry Warren. I saw mm -hmm. a video of, of what he experienced and then immediately people say, oh, no, he's a fraud. He's a fraud. Charles Holt. No, he's a fraud. Uh, Sergeant Peniston. No, mm -hmm. also a fraud. Uh, they, they receive a lot of hate. Mm -hmm. But when you yeah. connect all the dots and connect all the people, yeah. it's a little bit too suspicious now. I mean, everybody had this experience. So mm -hmm. are they all lying or did they, the experience really happen? Uh, I think it all happened. Yeah, it's, it's that yeah. simple. Why would why would you risk your career? Yeah, uh, to, yeah. To, to make up a story. And, and I mean, what do, do people mm -hmm. earn? Nothing. I mean, it's it's career damaging. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, enhancing. Mm -hmm. I, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. the, the fact that I mean, he uh, Larry Warren got out way before his before his time because um, he wasn't doing the job that he was supposed to be doing. And they, and they were keeping an eye on him because he was asking questions and you know they probably they told him to you know knock it mm -hmm. off but you mm -hmm. know but he was he was pursuing you know the truth and i yeah. i think over time you know with this whole you know with the trolls and all these negative people um i just think that static and that static is what's um slowing it slowing any progress down to be able to you know to to learn more to, to again advance and get to that next level and you know and, and that's why um and i don't have to be friends with any of these guys i mean you know i i've never met larry in the whole thing i but i like him i mean i think he's very very creative and i think uh, i think he's had a hard life um but I, I think he was definitely thrown under the bus. And people will, people throw all this, 
information. Well, look at this picture. It looks like it was doctored up and this and that and that. I'm like, I don't care. I don't care. The fact that he said in that book that when he got to that place and he felt it, I, I know right on the money that, you know, yeah. he, he was, he was telling his truth. And, yes. and I do think that there was a lot of stuff going on where they could alter your mind. I mean, apparently if I lost those two hours of of time without consciously knowing that I did, that should speak volumes for itself. Am I lying? Yeah. No. I mean, you know, why, you know, no. Um, and Charles it, Holt also said that there was missing time. Oh, and, really? Yeah. Soldiers uh, in, uh, experienced missing time, but also at one time, one soldier threw, threw away his gun and broke down. Uh, because he had some kind of experience, a paranormal experience, yeah. and he threw away his gun, like, I'm not going to use them anymore. Um, so, a lot of, a lot happened to pe people individually. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, inter the other interesting element is, is that the commander of the 81st Security Police Squadron has been silent all through all these experiences. It's like... It's like the people under his command, all these security police personnel, uh, where, where is their leader in this whole thing? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, halt, halt is there, but where, where is he, you know? And yeah. um, I, I think he's got some connection with the CIA or something like that. Uh, that that's one of the stories I have, and I have no doubt about that. He, mm. But he, he was just, uh, uh, yeah. I, I think he was part of the control of getting everybody to, to, to shut up when people were writing their statements and then they come back with another statement and told to sign it, that whole thing. I mean, I, I, I can see that. I, you know, I can clearly see that. Um, and I can see, you know, with, uh, I was actually, when I heard that John Burroughs was one of the airmen who saw the UFO or what went out there in the field, I thought that was great. I was like so pleased to hear that because it was like about time that he handles that kind of harassment from it because, <laughs> because he was just, I, I could have smacked him, but um, yeah, he, but John is John. I mean, he, he's like, for me, he's like that. He's like that, you know, that pesky kind of, kind of brother that, you know, um, but all in all though, he recently wrote a book, uh, that I think is really, really good. The, the weaponization of, of uh, UAP, something like that. So uh, that that I've, book really led me to, and and the the Enigma book is is good too. Uh, that that Jim wrote. It's uh, uh, you can feel like you're there. I mean, they wrote it in okay. such a way that you really do feel like you're there. And um, yeah, the only thing, the only negative thing about Jim's book is that I, I just thought that he was kind of uh, snide about the way he talked about John and, and that kind of thing. But you know, yeah, and they saw the triangle uh, land, mm -hmm. and they walked around it, and they felt like the surface was alive and interacting mm -hmm. with them, and it contained hieroglyphics. Yeah, yeah that was with uh, Jim. Jim, uh, John, John didn't experience that. John had his own experience. I think he, uh, he apparently disappeared at one point. point. There were okay. some people that said they saw him one minute. Um, this woman who worked in supply, her name is Cookie. She said she could see him and had this uh, aura around him. And then also he disappeared and then he came back. Um, and he wasn't even aware of that happening to him but i mean hmm. and uh apparently the energy at that point pushed them all to the ground um or most of them were, you know they kind of went forward and they couldn't get up you know because of the wh whatever that uh gravity was pushing on them to keep them down mm -hmm. uh, huh. there's this place called skinwalker ranch have you ever heard about it I, I have. Isn't that in Arizona? Isn't that somewhere near me? 
Yeah, it has um, it has paranormal activity and UFO activity, mm. and it's crazy. It's crazy, wow. um, and it's it's uh, what you're telling me about the the base. It has it has some resemblance with uh, Skinwalker Ranch. Wow. They also saw portals and uh, wow. strange beings, and uh, but also uh, cattle mutilations. Mm. So it's it's crazy, it's crazy, yeah. and uh, I can imagine for some people it's just too much to take. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. Yeah. The... Um, but... I, we have some questions of the of the uh, subscribers. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to uh, continue what you were telling, or uh, are you no, ready no, for the no. questions? No, I'm ready. Yeah? I'm okay. ready. Okay. <laughs> because um, um, they ask a lot of questions. So I think it's best to, uh, to pick some, a few out. And, um, uh, okay. Um, okay, yeah. There was something about retrieved material um, that an electrical engineer supposedly told you. Do you recall that? Yeah, I was uh, at... <laughs> Uh, I was in the reserves and we were at a retirement, no, a promotion party. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden I see this guy and he's in his, and I, this is in the army, army mm -hmm. reserves. Mm -hmm. And I see this guy in an air force uniform and he notices some of my ribbons were air force and he goes, Oh, I see you got this. this, this. And then I asked him about the, uh, started talking about Rendlesham forest and talking about, RAF Woodbridge and the UFO uh -huh. sightings, uh -huh. and he grew he grew cold. He just shut up. And then I said, "Well, do you know anything about that?" And he said, "Well, if I did, you know, I'd have to uh, kill you or shoot you or whatever." And then, of course, I threw it back at him. This is a three-star general. I figured he was pretty high up there in '78, '80. And he said, uh, "And I said, well, go ahead, shoot me." You know, <laughs> then he said, "Well, I." <laughs> I've got to get back to my party. I'm like, okay. And then this other guy, this electrical engineer came up to me at that point. And I did feel like I was on, uh, uh, what is that? What is that TV show? Um, with, uh, that guy Mulder. Oh yeah. Uh, X-Files. X-Files. I felt like I was on the X-Files at that point. And, <laughs> and this electrical engineer out of a, some uh, small base in Maryland said, you know, they did find something out there and uh, it's a, a material that we're actually using that's not indigenous to earth. And, uh, and it uh, can take high degrees of heat and it's like a plastic and it's very light in weight and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. we only talked for a few minutes, but I walked away feeling like, whoa, you know, I, yeah. you know, he, he overheard me and then I overheard him and yeah, <laughs> I, I, I shared that, I think, uh, with, uh, Stephen Greer's, uh, disclosure project. Nice. Nice. So, uh, yeah, you hear it from several sites that, uh, mm -hmm. they have materials which have incredible properties, mm -hmm. really. Even Ross Coulthard, uh, recently, um, he's from Australia. He made a documentary, documentary also called The Phenomenon. It's, it's a beautiful uh, documentary. And nice. uh, he recently did a, a, an interview with uh, Project Unity. Uh, that's a guy who, uh, who is also active on Twitter. And, um, well, he also told that uh, he heard about people uh, back engineering craft and uh, material. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's more to it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, uh, somebody else uh, asked a question about the regression. Well, we uh, answered that. You answered that already. Um, um, okay. Did Did you hear uh, or see anything that would co corroborate Larry Warren's claim that on the third and final night of the UFO incident, that he and the group, including his superior officers, Colonel Holt, as well as Colonel Williams, witnessed a bright amorphous craft that seemed to have emerged from a sudden explosion of light that even caused retinal burns to Warren and others. Uh, he says that as the military cordon surrounded the multicolored UFO, he saw 
um, military cameraman filming and photographing uh, it all unfolds. Uh, apparently some communication took place with Colonel Williams after three childlike silvery appearing mm -hmm. aliens seemingly floated out from the craft. That's about as much as I remember. Hmm. Well, that well, I think in uh, even in John Burroughs' book, one of the um, uh, one of the, uh, the guys that has attested many times that he was there was uh, Adrian Butzinger. I can't pronounce his last name. Um, so you know he was there. In fact, uh, you know I, I don't know what else to say about that. As for what he saw, again, it's the same thing like with the binary code and with whatnot. I, I truly believe that that Larry saw what he saw, and and why he saw what he saw. And apparently, another thing came up recently was that uh, Colonel Halt was re um, Colonel Williams or General Williams. Uh, after he died, his relatives had some information. Uh, about the sighting that was out there. And apparently uh, they said, we'll give it to you and, but for X amount of money. So he was like, I'm not gonna pay for that. I'm like, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> you know, it was just kind of, it was just kind of like, why would you want to do that? You know, but um, so he, so Colonel Hall, Hall said, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna buy it. Somebody else can buy it. Maybe you can get the guy from, Amazon, he can buy it and then he can share it with us. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, I, uh, there was a guy that was on patrol the following day that actually took Colonel Williams to the air, aircraft that was waiting in the parking area to uh, deliver the film that was taken there. So, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and the airman, this guy, George Conway, he, he said, he looked, you know, in the rear view mirror and was looking at the colonel and the colonel said, what are you doing? What are you looking at? It was either him or it was Captain Barano. It was one of those two. And, but they were just really, again, like, just look straight ahead, you know? And, mm -hmm. uh, and he delivered this whatever canister to the, uh, to the guy in the airplane and uh, the, they took off. I think they went to Ramstein in Germany or something like that. Yeah. Of course, he could have been giving him a canister filled with hot soup so he's nice and warm while he's. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I like this one because somebody uh, was bringing up the lighthouse. And um, it was there, of course, because the North Sea was, uh, was closed. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot is. Uh, um, they say, oh, it's just a lighthouse. Mm -hmm. But you, as you said already in the. Uh, in the Reddit uh, post, the lighthouse didn't fly across the wrong the runway. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It yeah. didn't pass me and go up, and it didn't split into no. three pieces. No. Yeah. No. So it's it's no. insane. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I hope people out there will will be a little bit more um, that uh, that lighthouse. You you know. The time I was there, I I could never see the lighthouse. I could never see the light from it and uh, saw a lot of fog roll across the runway and I could hear the fog horn in the distance sometimes, but yeah, uh, yeah, this, this lighthouse and thank God it's gone. Apparently they tore it down, which I, I actually I'm kind of sad about because I, I like lighthouses. I think they're kind of cool looking, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it wasn't a lighthouse. It's like people, no lighthouse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No and, one with a uh, flashlight, you know? <laughs> no, no, no. So, uh, well, we can agree that a lot happened on the base and that there are a lot of individual stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you combine them all, uh, a clear picture emerges. That's uh, a conclusion we, we can draw, certainly. And it's not only Bentwaters Woodbridge, it's also in the Netherlands, also mm -hmm. other bases in the United States. Uh, Robert Salas, do you know Robert Salas from Malmstrom mm -hmm. Air Force yes. Base? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, he was also very disappointed with the report, the UAP Task Force report. 
other people of course are very uh, happy mm. about it because at least something uh, is set in motion yeah. but uh, Robert Sellers was very disappointed because he hoped yeah. that finally we could go on but first this nuclear connection we have to yeah. push it push it because it's yeah. too important it's really important for yeah. for mankind they'll not they'll never disclose who the, the who question they're going to disclose yeah it's what you see there you know and it's up to you to yeah exactly to, exactly yeah that tic tac or, or whatnot um but the reality is, is that, at least they're not saying it's a uh uh, hot air balloon that, that was always a big one you know hot air balloon <laughs> yeah but i yeah. i what's that really at least it's not being denied at this point it's not made a, like a almost like a mockery it's actually um accepted it's the yeah. lowest level yeah. of acceptance but yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right this is, yeah this is on like the this is like the best acceptance you know if you look at yeah. the last seven years which it's not much but yeah i see it as a very small baby step and i think there's more to come in yeah. time i think it's easy to get um frustrated i was frustrated obviously you want some actual information um that yeah. we already that we don't know i think we all know <laughs> about the yeah. uh, validity of ufos at this point but i think it's mainly geared for the common public so that's why um I think they're going so slow. Uh, and I, I think I mentioned yesterday um, on the broadcast just, or when we were talking before, it's like, I feel like this report should have came out in 1955, 1958. Yeah. You know, just yeah. Acknowledging that, oh, we don't know what these are, but here we are, 2021. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, sometimes, sometimes I think that, you know, when you see some of these films come out that are considered uh, science fiction, and when you start looking at them and you start saying, you know, I think there's some truth behind this so-called science fiction. I mean, I think they are preparing us, but they're not going to tell us that that's really uh, more than just science fiction. I mean, I look at uh, Interstellar as one film. I love that film, uh, you know, but there are just so many different, um, yeah, so many different different elements and uh that they, uh, yeah, they, they, they had the bar way low. I think it was, it was somewhere deep in the Grand Canyon. It was so low, uh, <laughs> but I, I didn't even really, I think I read pieces of it and I was just, cause I knew it was, you know, they're not going to tell us what, you know, what, what is coming out through this, you know, um, people that go through the regression and the ones that describe things that happen and, I mean, we hear about yeah. the, uh, you know, people that say they see these giant uh, owls and how, you know, they're using these screens to, you know, again, manipulate our consciousness. So, you know, we understand certain things. And, uh, but yeah. I don't think it has anything to do with us being afraid. <laughs> In, unless the thing we're going to do is kill whatever's new that comes to our planet i mean we're, it's like yeah. like it's like damn it we got to keep the aliens off of the united states yeah <laughs> yeah what are we afraid of because yeah this it this could mean so so much uh to 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 humanity i mean in all in all ways i mean yeah. if we make contact we could make uh, make a technical leapfrog yeah. we could well, not ever well, imagine yeah and that's really a good point because did you ever look at, uh, what was that? Um, in 1980, we were using typewriters, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't even think at the time, we were still using carbon paper with, between the, uh, you know, our paper. And to think that we catapulted to computers, to video, oh, really? yeah. to do all these other things that happened. I mean, it may seem like a small step, but in a way, I mean, the fact that you can have a, your phone is a computer and all, does all these things. I mean, you know, yes. I think there's something to be said about that too. I mean, I think we're Absolutely. given lip, we're giving some pieces, but I, uh, I think there's a leap there too. Um, yeah, that's handed to people, but you know, so are people coming up with this? Probably not on their own because if so we would have had this we would have had this centuries ago I, you know yes. we, you know i mean where, where's Absolutely. our uh, yeah 
And Absolutely. Actually, that, that kind of got me thinking too about um, how maybe, you know, there might be this um, almost like a technological seeding. And I think of um, one of my heroes like Nikola Tesla, how he received information for his physics. And it's very similar to what you described, where he would really just get flashes of information. Mm -hmm. Now, it, uh, he didn't really, you know, there's a lot of mysticism about, you know, uh, extraterrestrial lineage and things like that. But um, I more so just read what he wrote and he described very similar how you, he just got this information and it was clear as day mm -hmm. and used that information for his inventions and his uh, engineering. And this was a yeah. phenomenon that he tried to have psychologists look at at the time. They had no idea what it was. And um, also it started when he was a, like a little toddler getting these flashes of, you know, just things in his vision that he couldn't get rid of. So it's yeah. there's definitely something there um, with this, like almost um, this, this connection via our awareness that mm -hmm. it's not, it's, we just don't understand it scientifically. We, it's really kind of, uh, the assumption of consciousness is terrible. And it's, I think, a very limiting factor when you start talking about these experiences because they just don't fit in with the mm -hmm. assumptions that yeah. um, have been produced. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's uh, unfortunate, but we do have a lot of history of people um, explaining very similar things, just kind of getting information from mm -hmm. some other source. Um, but I do believe yeah. that we will figure some more of this out, but uh, it's going to take time, unfortunately. But mm -hmm. um, the pieces are going together, but they're falling so slow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yes. no. <laughs> the gravity chamber or something, they're falling, their feathers maybe just slightly mm -hmm. stacking on each other. But it's, I can see, even in just the last five years, I can see a small attitude change with uh, just on your post which is in the right direction but um mm -hmm. it's still gonna it's still a fight to get the truth out there and really start doing getting the information that needs to be um achieved yes because everybody on collect the list, it's their right yeah. for this interview. yeah oh absolutely yeah I've nobody been, uh, yeah yeah I, I'll, I'll tell you tell you too is that you know I, I have been working over the past 20, yeah, actually since I learned about the UFO coming back again and wanting to get my story out. Um, at first, it's like I waited, you know, I would talk to Jim Peniston or Larry or different people and thinking that maybe they would, you know, we could kind of piggyback on each other to really help get the story out to get momentum. And, and and that didn't happen. And then, you know, it wasn't until maybe the past two two years. I, oh, then in 99 is when, uh, was when Stephen Greer contacted me. Mm. And uh, Georgina Bruni, who wrote the book, uh, You Can't Tell the People. Um, and so they noticed me then. And then, um, and then it just kind of went stale. I mean, I, I was all for, you know, still going after it. And then when I got kicked off the the, rent, uh, the, uh, the Justice for 81st uh, page, I started the Lone Ranger UFO site on Facebook. And it's funny, it's that that's gotten more notoriety on in books. And <laughs> but, but the thing it is- It still exists? That, what's that? Still, oh, yeah. It's, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the Ransom nice. Lone Ranger UFO site. Yeah, okay. I'm the nice. Lone Ranger, by the way. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Anyone who joins is a Lone Ranger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I, but I, um, but then you know you get all these like I just contacted the uh, International UFO Congress. I I did a presentation there last year, uh, virtual, and I really wanted to be at a conference where I can stand up in front of people and share my story and. This year it's kind of like no, no, we, we you know, uh, maybe next year, and um, then uh, and then I find out they get the, they have the old regulars again. And the same thing with uh, the MUFON. There's one in Las Vegas coming up, and I've been trying to reach out to um, uh, I can't remember his first name again, Solace, uh, and mm -hmm. a few other people say, hey, can you put a word in for MUFON because I'd like to be there, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's like people are not really still 
aware and it's it's becoming slow and then the contact with the desert the contact in the desert one uh they pretty much said well no um no we don't want you to be a speaker we have these other people like uh you know these people that talk about things that they're not really you know mm-hmm. they're not where they're not experiencers you know it's like they're talking about the research oh yeah well i discovered you know uh that i don't know a tip is just not good i'm going to spend an hour talking about how the tic tac was not minty at all but and you know these are you know and i'm thinking why do you want the same you know the same people on all the time i mean there's so many other people with stories yeah and, exactly and i'm getting old <laughs> I'm getting <laughs> oh, yeah. older i'm getting older <laughs> And, you know, I, and I just kind of think that, you know, hey, it's about time people can hear what Lori has to say. I, exactly. I, just, I mean, because um, I usually don't mind at all taking a back seat. But it's like when all these other people kind of keep pushing forward and everyone's just like letting them push forward. And then the people that may have more information to share, um, I think it would be wonderful for them to have the chance to really speak. But everyone keeps, when it comes to Rendlesham, the, the first two names that come up, it's usually Jim Peniston and John, you know, and uh, I'm thinking, and I, I understand, and I totally understand. Yeah, yeah, it's like every time I see that, I'm thinking there's more to the story, you know, and it's not just me either. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to, I'm telling you this, that I like to share. I don't want to, you know, it's not about, you know, yeah. just making it about me. And I, I don't want, I, I'm not looking for money. You know, I, I'm fine in, in that department. I got a good retirement. So, you know, I mean, it's just that whatever's out there that's put in me, it's been pressing on me to get my, get your butt in gear, Lori, and get out there and you got to start talking to people. Yes. So that's, yes. What, so that's why I've been so, this has been so important for me to do exactly. these type of podcasts and i like i like the fact that uh, it you know ufology in general uh they say it's a man thing but if you, you read my really, mind <laughs> <laughs> if you if you really look at it i, I mean leslie keen initiated the whole thing with uh the new york new york times article uh alex dietrich really uh was a game changer now uh, regarding the tic tac uh, the woman mm-hmm. who uh, uh, was uh, in uh, flying in the in the fighter jet. Yeah. Um, and now you, I like that. I like that. I think we need more women in the field uh, mm-hmm. to listen more to the women because they have another approach, mm-hmm. generally. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Expertise, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, times are changing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, yeah, yeah, and and you know, it's it's kind of nice. I mean, if this is a way to to put a mark on humanity to say um, we we're really figuring out the meaning of life, what why we're here, mm-hmm. what we're supposed to be doing, um, and and how how does this affect the overall how we fit into the universe, and you know. Um, yes. You know, I mean, are the Palladians just after our copper? You know, I mean, we don't know. Maybe we're here to to be the miners for other planets. You know, you know. Eh. You know, um, heavy metals can be found everywhere in the universe. In universe, and what's the only thing that is important on this planet? Uh, uh, life, the people, mm-hmm. uh, consciousness. That's what it's all about. That's the real gold. Yeah. Yeah. That's the that's the heavy metal. <laughs> I like it. Heavy metal. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> throw, throw, I did go to a Led Zeppelin concert when I was in England. I didn't like it though. I'm sorry. I'm not into heavy metal. But your heavy metal, <laughs> I like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, certainly, certainly. Yeah. Well, Laurie, I appreciate it a lot. Yeah. Well, dude, we'll here. we'll have to do this again. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I like it. And if if you're if you like to do it again, and we can do another session, no problem. Okay, okay, that's great. <laughs> okay, I appreciate oh. it a lot. Yeah. Okay, okay. 
I was just going to ask, uh, what are you going to be, is this, you're just going to put this on your website or Reddit? It will be on Reddit and on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, great. So, um, and you can respond, of course, uh, and maybe um, you can be around uh, on Reddit when people have some additional questions because sure. you already, already uh, answered some questions. So uh, people, people like that. Uh, it's yeah. the, you know, the short lines. Well, yeah, well, I, I like people to know that I'm real and I'm down to earth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although exactly. I might not be from this planet. No, only <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Okay. Well, Lori, let, let's keep in touch. And okay, uh, I, send, I send you the links when, uh, when it's broadcasted and okay, uh, put great. on Twitter. I think it will be tonight already. So. Well, I, I, I'd like to thank both of you. Um, thank you. You both have asked yeah, some really, re- yeah, really, really thoughtful questions and comments, and uh, uh, it actually opened up my own thinking on on things, especially with the consciousness. And, yeah. yeah, and and the regression thing, eh? maybe it's it's uh, something to to think about. Well, I'll let you know when I do it. As soon as, soon as somebody, <laughs> as soon as Ian Hauling, he he says he's got a couple of connections and nice. Um, yeah. Who All knows right. what that brings to light? <laughs> oh my God. Oh yeah. I, I'll, I'll say I wasn't on, on, I wasn't, uh, uh, they didn't do regression on me. I was just chatting away and they'll say, no, 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 you, you were, uh, you were speaking in tongues, Lori. Oh like, no. no. <laughs> okay. All well, right. we keep in touch and uh, we'll see you around on Reddit. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you very much, Laurie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Nice meeting you. Bye-bye. Bye. Nice meeting you.